So to start, I'm going to get into a presentation here. And um, hold on here just a minute. <clears throat> We'll, we'll, we'll go back. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so I'm just gonna start with a couple of slides. And like I said, I'm gonna kind of go back and forth in between, unless it becomes very cumbersome. If it becomes cumbersome, we'll just kind of finish up the slides and then I'll get into the parts and pieces so we're not delaying and, and spending a lot of time back and forth. So to get started, it's really about the advantages of drip irrigation. And I'll talk about a couple of disadvantages. I didn't put them on this slide, but the advantages to drip irrigation is you're delivering water where, where you specifically need it. Um, you're not overspraying things, you're not running water down a gutter, you're not wasting water, you're not watering weeds, you're delivering water where you need it, and it's a slow delivery. So re really, regardless of your soil type, you are able to deliver the water where you need it without worrying about water flowing off the surface of the soil, going somewhere else that's not needed. So it really matches any soil type, and I'll talk about frequencies of irrigation and so forth kind of towards the end as far as scheduling goes. But this will help with reduced weed growth because of course you're not watering any areas that you don't need. There will still be weeds. Weeds can kind of come up anywhere. They grow in the asphalt sometimes. Um, but this will help we reduce some of the, the weed growth because you're not giving them excess water. Also, um, you can water any time of day or night. Uh, you don't have the same type of issues with overspray and evaporative losses and so forth with drip irrigation as you would with spray irrigation. So if, you, if there's different situations where you know you've got to water during the day, you can water this during the middle of the day. Um, there's no blockage of the spray due to larger plant material because you're delivering water at the ground surface. If you've got, if some of you may have spray heads right now and you've got taller plants and and depending on where that spray head, it is getting blocked. It can't reach outward because it hits the, the, the foliage of some of the plants. That can be an issue. So drip irrigation will alleviate some of that. And in most cases, drip irrigation is easy to assemble. It, it doesn't require any glue. It's usually hand pushed together parts. Um, so it's, I think for most part, it, it's pretty easy. Occasionally some of the little barb fittings or something a little tight to push, but you can do it. And, and it can be done very easily. And it can be work done with all kinds of plant combinations or specialty situations. Um, I will show you some examples of raised beds with vegetable gardening and so forth. I've used drip irrigation in my vegetable gardens for oh, the last, whatever, 15 years or so and been very successful with it. It works great and I like it. We do wanna talk about flow rates. Um, now this is something that a lot of people have a hard time with regardless of what kind of irrigation they're doing is just understanding volume. So volume flow depends on pipe size. So I've got a little chart here, and this, is, this chart is for spray irrigation, but I, I put it up here to illustrate a point. Um, this, this chart on the side is talking about gallons per minute or gallons per hour. Um, and the inside diameter of a pipe is ID, the OD. You don't need to get all caught up in any of that stuff. The, the pipe size is on the far left column where it's one half inch, three quarter inch, one inch, and so forth up to two inch. But you can see from that chart on a, on a gravity or low pressure, which is in green, if you have a one inch pipe, it can deliver 960 gallons per hour. It's a lot of water. And we see that all the time through metered, metered uses and different stuff. We, we will see 900 up to 1,000, up to 1,500 gallons per hour going through a, a meter at any given time. Now, that's a spray, those are typical spray head applications. Depending on the number of spray heads you have and, and the nozzles in those spray heads, you can put down a lot of water very quickly. So, but drip, drip irrigation on the other hand, instead of talking about gallons per hour, drip irrigation, now you're talking about gallons, excuse me, <clears throat> in spray irrigation, you're talking about gallons per minute and, and it adds up to th you know, 1,000 gallons per hour. With drip irrigation, you're talking about very few gallons per hour, 1.5 to 10 gallons per hour instead of 1,000 gallons per hour. Now, again, that flow is gonna vary depending on the number of emitters and the number of outputs you have in that drip irrigation system. But it's to illustrate the point, you, you're, your whole dynamic needs to shift, your whole understanding needs to shift about the volume of water being delivered through drip versus spray applications. 
Now a typical drip system using one gallon per hour emitters, you could run approximately 1400 emitters, uh, 1400 emitters and have enough flow through that, through that three quarter inch pipe to deliver all the water you need. Again, because it's low volume, you have plenty of water for each emitter. Now, I don't know anybody that would have 1400 emitters on one zone. That's, it's just not really done. Um, but I, a perfect example, in my own yard, I have a zone of irrigation. I bet it has 200 emitters on it. It works fine. Um, I don't have any pressure problems, don't have any flow problems. It, it works fantastic. So to, to illustrate this, I hope this works. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of talk about how you would determine flow rate really simply from your home. Now, if you've got some valves in the ground, I'm going to talk about valve assemblies and different things. But if you've got a hose spigot with secondary water or a hose spigot on your house, depending on what source you're using, this bucket method will work for you. Now, I'm just going to click on this YouTube video link and you should be seeing my screen. You should be hearing my screen and hopefully this will be successful. This is just a very short video. And there's no volume yet, so don't panic. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting a note that this probably isn't working. So, you know what, I'll just get out of here and we'll go back to the presentation. Hold on, sorry for that. Sometimes these things work, sometimes they don't. But, okay, there's a little link to a YouTube video right there. So, what I'd like, would like to invite you to do, uh, hold on here just a minute. Let's go back. I'm sorry about this. Sometimes there's, there's minor, minor technical issues here, but all right. All right, so anyway, so there's a, there's a YouTube link. You can watch that little video of how you determine the flow rate and get a calculated volume of flow through a hose spigot of any kind of, it can be your secondary hose spigot, it can be culinary. You're basically timing how long it takes to put water into a five gallon bucket. And you know the volume, it's five gallons, now you know the time and you, you do a little mathematical calculation and you know the flow rate per hour. And then once you know that flow rate per hour, then it's very easy to determine how long you're how much how long you're going to be able to run your zone and how many emitters you can put on this zone. All right, so let's go. Um, uh, let's see, I've lost my controls here. You know what? Sorry about this. It seems that I've lost a little bit of, um, like the presentation wasn't there. I'm getting a note. Give me a second here. We will get this figured out. There we go. Now I think we're probably up with the, with the presentation. So you should, should be able to see me. All right. So I've been talking, you didn't miss, you didn't miss much on the slides. So back to flow, once you've got that flow figured out, you're gonna be able to know the maximum number of emitters you can put on there. If you have a flow of say 800 gallons per hour, you know, you would know if I'm using two gallon per hour emitters, you know, I can use 400 emitters and not run into any volume problems delivering water to those plants. So I, I wanted to move on now to the next, the next little piece here of the, the components that you're gonna be dealing with. Now, some of you may be dealing with hose end type connections. Some of you may be dealing with regular, you know, valves and valve assemblies as I've shown in this picture. There's lots of different types of valve assemblies and, and you built your own and some out of PVC. Notice the image on the bottom, the bottom right is a little bit 
interesting. It looks like the pipe was melted just so it'd all fit together. If you're doing some stuff like that, you know, be, be careful because you, you change the hydraulics, you change the flow, you change pressures when you start putting in lots of elbows and start trying to melt pipe or do weird things to make it fit. Um, but here's, here's some typical valve assemblies. And with those valve assemblies, you can connect PVC to those, you can connect poly pipe to those. And then from, you know, the different kinds of drip irrigation pipe can be connected to those all using just various types of fittings. So here is an illustration of a valve, just a typical valve with a, with a valve assembly. Now there's a standard valve and there's a valve with pressure and a pressure regulator or, or a filter all combined into it. So I want to take just a second. Actually, you can probably see my screen. Well, to make this bigger, let's do this. Um, hopefully you can see. Well, I, I hope you can see this and it's big enough. So this is a valve with a pressure regulator and filter all built in one. So this one, it actually has a pressure regulation down to 40 PSI, drops it down to 40. Now 40 is pretty high and inside you've got a filter. Okay, so this is one, one type and 40 though is not low enough for most drip irrigation applications, depending. We do have some of these in our garden that operate on poly pipe, a poly fitting. The pressure's fine at about 40. There's other types of drip filter, you know, here's, a, here's what's called a Y filter and a pressure regulator. This regulator is at 30 and, you know, this threads onto a valve. This is a different type of thing where each of these pieces is separate. And then once again, inside here is a filter. So you can see, you know, the filter part. Anytime you're doing drip irrigation, it's very important that you have a filter. And then, so I've, I've talked a little bit about valves. I'm showing you valve assembly and filter things kind of together. Before I get to, well, I've got another slide. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping around here. I get too excited about all these component parts. So I want to show you the parts, but I also want to show you some slides. But it's very important that you use a filter and then a regulator. If you, depending on where you are in, in the water system, even for your house, you've got water coming out of your house, probably not really high pressure. It may only be at 40 PSI or 50 PSI. But even that can be too much pressure for drip parts. And so you need to be regulated down to, depending on the parts you're using, anywhere from eight PSI up to about 25, 30 to 40 at a, at a maximum. And so again, depending on your water source, some of you I know that have secondary water, you may, be, you may have water coming into your system at 80 to 90 PSI. And that's got to be brought down. If it's not, you're going to blow the ends and pieces off of your drip irrigation parts very, very easily. Okay, so let's go back to this. <clears throat> okay, so your standard valves, your valves with pressure regulation, and then here's some filter stuff. Now notice in the pictures, there's lots of different kinds of filters. Um, there's canister filters, there's little teeny filters, there's Y filters, the big, the one that says action on it, which is a big strainer, kind of a, it's a strainer type filter. Um, for drip irrigation, one thing with filtration, I'm gonna show you a couple more filters here. One thing with filtration is there's a number. The higher the number, it, the finer the filter. So if you get a filter and you buy a filter and it says, you know, filter with 32 mesh or 50, that's not enough for drip irrigation. Um, that's, it's gonna filter out larger debris that may, may happen with secondary water. And many, many of you are using secondary water. So filtration is a must. If you don't filter that out, the, the, the debris and the stuff that's in secondary water, even though it's small enough to go through a sprinkler head, it's not small enough to go through a, a drip irrigation emitter or a component and it'll plug it all up, your plants will die and then it, it'll just be a mess. So filtration is a must and ideally your filter screen size needs to probably be around 150. Now I will caution you if you go higher than 150 up to say 400, that, that is a very, very fine mesh and it's gonna catch everything, meaning you'll have to clean the filter more often using secondary water. Now, if you're using culinary water, 
a house just from your house with some hose connections or something, the filtration is much, much less of an issue because that water is already treated and it's drinking water and, it, and it's clean. The only reason you may want to have a filter in there is if something happens in a point of connection or you're using hose ends or something and the hose is off and some debris gets in there, that filter will keep any debris from moving through that system all the way to the end of your lines or into your emitters. But otherwise, filtration on drinking water is not as necessary. So again, let me, let me just stop. Um, well, before I stop and show you some other components, the pressure regulator. Now, between filtration and pre pressure regulation, those usually come together, just kind of like I showed you in these combinations. They, they usually go right together, usually next to a valve. So you know, your valve assembly, your filters, they're all kind of close together. They're usually, not always. Sometimes you'll have a valve in one area and you, you run some PVC main line or something and you don't need the filter until right before you start doing the, the emitters. So you could have a separate little box, you could have a separate little location for those filters. So pressure regulation is really important. There's all kinds of pressure regulators for hose end fittings, you know, and they have a number on them. All of them have a number on them. You know, this is a 25 PSI, there's 10 PSI, there's eight. Like I said, some of them you wanna, you wanna go as low as 10 or eight and, and sometimes even five. Um, I'll, I'll show you the pieces and which ones will fit with each type of pressure regulation as we go. But this little image here, this slide shows some of the types. Um, if you're using hose end, there are hose end little regulators. Just looks like this, this is a 25, it's got hose end threads, you know, and then it, it just connects to all the other fittings as well. So that is one other thing that I, I should mention here is if you're using hoses, all the threads are different than your typical pipe threads. And so make sure you have hose threaded fittings because if you start getting combinations of all those, you need adapters and all kinds of pieces in there and it can be a little bit frustrating. And, and if you don't, you try to thread those together, you'll cross thread something and then it'll leak. Won't, won't go together very well. So now before I move on, um, let, me, let me just stop this for just a second. And um, so you, so here's, here's a separate little pressure regulator by itself, um, 30 PSI, you, your big, a big, you know, this is that big mainline filter. Usually these are used on your mainline coming into the property. So whatever your point of connection is, it's coming in. This is filtering everything. So large debris can get stuck in this so it doesn't plug up your sprinkler heads and nozzles. Um, and these, these come apart. This one happens to be a 32 mesh screen size. And these are nice. They have a stainless steel, you know, filter part in there that comes out. So as that, as that filter gets plugged up, and the reason these are clear, so you can see in there, you can see if it's plugged up, really gunky. You can open that up. This just comes out. You can take a little brush and easily just hose that, get some clean water, hose this off, scrub this off stick it back in, stick it back together. Now remembering this is all connected in the ground. So usually this is inside of a valve box. Sometimes people bring this up above the ground. And so then it's easy to access, but being clear, if this is above the ground, it can grow algae in there. So I, I kind of recommend putting that in a valve box of some sort to keep it out of the sun and it'll reduce algae growth. It'll reduce some of the other issues you might have if that's just left in the sun. Okay. So, before I move on as well, because this will this will kind of be an issue. If you're, we talked, showed a little slide about valve assemblies and so forth. If you have an area that you need to add a zone or you're changing some things around and you're having a difficulty getting water to that space without having to run wire back to a timer or something, this is a little battery operated timer. So this end here, rather than get, being wired back to a timer, it plugs into this, it's got a battery in it. That's your little timer. And then this is now is a valve that controls the, just that one zone. So you could set up a drip zone anywhere, add a battery operated valve, as long as you've got the main water source coming in. Now this valve will just, based on whatever little time schedule you set in this little timer here, it'll operate that drip zone, you know, independent of the other timer that, that may be in your yard somewhere or two. You know, so if you need to create a drip zone somewhere, this is one way to be able to do that as long as you can tap into that main, that main water source that's always charged. So those are great things. There's also some little, you know, if 
you can set up little timers. This is just a little hose end timer. So if you're running off your hose, but rather than trying to figure out how, oh, you know, I, I forget to turn it on, I forget to turn it off. This is a little timer. It's just a little dial thing. Now Orbit Irrigation is making more and more of these. They even have a smart timer that's a hose end, has an app to your phone, different things. So there's, there's some technology and tools coming out to make it a lot easier if you're using hose end type fittings and connections where you don't have to worry about turning it on, turning it off and remembering how long it's been running. Um, same type of deal though, it's got a, a little pressure regulator here. You, you know, if out of your hose, if it's a secondary hose connection, you'd wanna put a filter in here. But really important if you wanna be doing some of that, you know, that's, that's a, a great little tool, great little things to have. So let's get back to here. Your hose end connections then, this kind of shows a great illustration of how that might work. You got your hose bib, your vacuum. They, they have a vacuum breaker in there, but it's not always necessary. Um, but a pressure re regulator, some of your adapters to just depending on the threadings and the fittings there, your filter, and then a poly pipe. And as I mentioned, you can, you can purchase hose end, um, battery operated, smart valves and so forth. Now, because that last video did not work, I've got another little video here link. You might just have to type this in. It's a little YouTube from Drip Depot. Now there's lots of little drip companies out there and, and some of them actually have some great resources. They've got great products. I have ordered drip products online before and been very successful. So, you know, if you can't find something at a local store, you can find it available on the internet and you can order those things. And, and you know, Amazon has some stuff. A lot of them just their specific drip like Drip Works, Drip Depot. There's some companies that have, you know, just do a great job. So um, that little video will kind of show you the valve assembly. It shows you how to go from a valve assembly to all the drip components and then to poly pipe and then onto the drip. So if, if that's a, an issue that you're struggling with, watch this little video. You'll see that it's, this is being recorded. You can just type in that URL or do a little search and you can find it, all right? So, Let's now move, we're gonna transition. So we've kind of covered, we've covered valves, filters and pressure regulation. Now I'm gonna get into the pipe and then from pipe, we're gonna get into emitters. And then from there, we're gonna even talk about conversion. How we, if you have some spray zones and you wanna make them drip zones, how do, you, how do you simply convert those zones without tons and tons of digging? Uh, we'll get into those things, but first pipe. Now, many of you are familiar with Schedule 40 PVC. It's the white, it's white PVC. It's the, it's the type of PVC used in our climate that tolerates some freezing. Um, if you come from California, they don't use Schedule 40. They use a Schedule 20. Um, so it's the pipe thickness. Anytime you're doing PVC in Utah, you'd use Schedule 40. Now, that's usually used for a main line. You know, if you're point of connection out in the street and in, it's, it's usually through PVC or a thick poly. Um, for drip irrigation though, drip irrigation is done with poly pipe. It's flexible, um, it can be punched through with emitters, it can be used for the main drip line as well as the lateral lines. And then I wanna talk a little bit about the thickness of the, the pipe wall, how big, how the diameter of that thickness, and then some main line type stuff. And I'm gonna switch back and show you some of these in just a second. Um, actually, I'm gonna stop now and I'm gonna switch and we're gonna talk about them now. So here is an example of a three quarter inch poly pipe. Okay. Now I'm gonna hopefully be able to illustrate this with the camera. Now this, this particular poly is actually a main line poly and it's thicker walled. It's, a, it's stiffer, it doesn't bend nearly as, as easily. And it's a thicker wall because this, this will tolerate a higher pressure and this is usually meant for main lines through your irrigation. Now. I don't know if you're gonna be able to tell this or not. I've got two pieces of pipe here. Um, maybe if this one were shorter, yeah, you'd be able to see. Anyway, this, this one that I'm holding here with this little barb fitting has a very, very, th it has a thin wall as opposed to this one. It's probably because you can't see the light, the light through it. This one has a much thicker um, wall. And if, if we were in person side by side with these guys, you, you could be able to tell. Anyway, this is probably not gonna work out very well. But it, when you're buying poly pipe, make sure and ask somebody, if you go to a sprinkler supply store, tell them you're using it for drip irrigation and they will get you the right um, pipe 
thickness, the diameter, you know, the, the wall thickness, so that you'll be able to punch in emitters and other tubing to this pipe. If you get the other one, it's near impossible to punch an emitter through there. You basically have to, you know, force drill a hole and then punch a, a barb fitting in. And it's just a lot of work. It can be done, but it is a lot of work. And it's almost impossible to do it just by hand without doing some sort of a pilot hole with a drill. So your little, your little poly tubing, you know, it's very, it's a thin wall. Uh, maybe you can kind of tell that. And then this one actually has a barbed pun barb punched into it. You can see how that barb punches in and it punches right through. Well, and that's the typical setup for drip irrigation. The, the poly pipe is used as the main line, the distribution line. So that is able to snake through um, your yard, wherever it is. And then you can punch in additional spaghetti tubing to deliver water through the emitter at the end. I'll, I'm gonna show you some more of that. Now there's other types of pipe that are referred to as like inline, inline emitter tubing. And so this is, this is thinner, this is a smaller diameter pipe. This is a half inch diameter instead of three quarter. And almost always the inline emitter tubing is half inch instead of three quarter. Um, so again, the diameter of the pipe. Now, if I get this just right with the camera, you can see there's something inside the pipe. Um, that's because the emitter is actually built in. So I'll put this up close here. You can see this hole. You can see that little hole in the pipe right here by my finger. And then it's kind of a, a bump in the pipe. There's an emitter built inside the pipe and that emitter regulates the volume of water. So you will buy these with a preset, prefixed volume per emitter output. And typically it's a 0.6 gallons or 0.9 gallons per hour um, for, for inline emitter tubing. Now there's several manufacturers. Rainbird has one. This particular one is a brand called Netafim. But Netafim has kind of just kind of become, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, Netafim. And they're using a different brand, but they mean inline emitters. It's kind of like the brand Band-Aid. It's a brand, but there's other companies that make Band-Aids, right? Um, so Netafim is inline emitter tubing. And I've, I've done a little, I cut away a little bit here so you can kind of see, well, he said, we'll do the best we can here with this camera, but you can kind of see the emitter in there. Now there's little teeny fine channels and that's the issue with filtration. If you don't filter, debris can get stuck in those and then it prevents water from coming out the, coming out the opening. And so you gotta have it clean. Now in this particular one here, this is an 18 inch spacing. Now if I back up a little bit, so you got an emitter every 18 inches. That's typical spacing. You either have emitters every 18 inches, every 12, or every 24 on this type of tubing. And I'll show you some pictures to illustrate why that is here in just a second. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the main tubing. You've got a poly main line, you've got inline emitter tubing, or, and then you've got you know, your thicker, your actual thicker, excuse me. So you got thick main line, that's the supply line, and you've got a poly line that, pun that you can use for distribution tubing where emitters are punched into it, just drip tubing. And that can be three quarter inch or half inch. And then you have Netafim or inline emitter type tubing and it's always half inch. And sometimes it's brown and sometimes it's not brown. Sometimes it's black, just like other tubing. So let me get back to, oops, hold on here. Just a minor, minor technical thing get back to the screen my slides here all right so hopefully hopefully you're clear on pipe types and some of the terms the main line lateral line lateral line takes takes water from the valve assembly to heads or emitters main line brings water to the valve assembly and then you're using poly poly or pvc almost all drip tubing is poly a polymer poly type tubing okay all right drip irrigation um Let's talk about now kind of an overview and the different types of nozzles. I shouldn't say nozzles, different types of heads, emitters, and so forth. So you're delivering water to a specific point very slowly and it's getting to the root system of the plant. It soaks in slowly and it moves through the soil and it's, it distributes water well and you're able to water deeply and very effectively the plant material you're, you're desiring to water. So little waste, helps with weed control, easy to install, kind of like I said. So 
these little videos are built in and this kind of illustrates inline drip emitters. You can see water coming out of that little hole and then point source. Now point source means you have an emitter and you're able to put that emitter exactly where you want it and you're delivering water to a specific point. Now the next, the next pictures here will illustrate some of how the different uses of the inline versus drip or you know the point source actually work out. So inline drip is best for high density planting. Now I'll show you some pictures of, of high density, this one. High density planting means you're running the inline tubing in a grid. Now notice all three of these pictures, the one picture at the bottom has no plant material, it's just the grid-like pattern showing how water is being put out in different, it, it's coming out of those different emitters in a grid and eventually as that's run to its full length of time, it's soaking the entire area, but you don't have overspray, you don't have blockage. So on high density plantings, it can water the entire bed evenly, assuming none, none of your emitters get plugged up. So the picture in the middle kind of shows that illustrated with some plant material bulbs or something coming up in a spring. Now, a lot of times, once you plant, you put that, you put bark over the top and that those drip tubings are hidden. They can also be buried, but I would always recommend not burying them very deep because if you need to access these, it's a real pain if you have to go digging for four inches, four inches, three inches or something to try to find those. And then you accidentally cut through them with your shovel when you're digging. So very and very shallow, cover them with mulch. They're out of the sun, but then when you need access, it's easy to scrape back the dirt, scrape back the bark and find these. Now notice the picture on the far right, that it's not a perfect line grid. Those are kind of snaked, they're winding. It's perfectly fine. This material is flexible. Um, the ideally though, to get even coverage, you're, you're spacing them evenly apart, whatever spacing you need, and then they, they wind together, which they've kind of done here, not perfectly. Um, but that's one way of doing an inline drip emitter. So you get, you get water dripping every 12 inches. And then if you put them 12 inches apart, now you have a line here at every 12 inches. Essentially, if they were per perfectly, you'd have a, a, a drip on each corner of a square foot. And then that's soaking in, moving through the soil and watering evenly. Or not, you're not going to spend that much time trying to line all those up if you use this, but that's the principle of this. So one other way to use inline em emitters is like this, where you have a larger shrub or something and fairly sparse planting, but you can loop, you can loop that tubing around the base of the plant. So around that plant now, there's probably four or five emitters, and then it moves on to the next one and four or five emitters. You can also buy that tubing without emitters that goes between um, between each plant if, it, if your plantings are very spaced. So for trees, large shrubs, you could do it this way. The other, you know, the other way to do that is with point source. So on this particular slide, I'm showing how this works. Now, at the top, that little illustration kind of points to an emitter punching right into the pipe, and then, you know, the tubing just goes out and ends. You don't need anything on it. Sometimes they have a little bug cap. The, uh, the picture there, on your right shows a pic shows the, the emitter punched into the brown pipe and then at the end it looks like there's also an emitter that's just a bug cap that's to keep bugs from climbing going up in the pipe but you can put the emitter right at the pipe or you can put the emitter at the end uh, right at the base of the plant and i prefer actually to put it at the end and then you know if it's easy to it's easy to fix if the emitters got a problem, you can actually just snip off a little bit of that poly, the little teeny quarter poly and add another emitter. If it's clear back at the, at the main line, your, your lateral line, you have to pull that out, put, in, put a new one in, and it's a little bit more of a hassle. Um, but both, both methods work, point source drip, inline drip, they both work very well. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop the slides here and I'm gonna show you some of these pieces now, kind of now that we've talked about these. So before I move on to those, let's, um, let's just talk about the pieces. So I've already talked about the inline, this inline tubing, talked about the other stuff. So before I get too far off of that though, the, this is all just punched together with little barb fittings. So this is the type of barb fitting that just push, they just push on, you know, whatever it is. This is a T connection of course, but it just pushes on. And I, if I force this on, it's not gonna come off unless I cut it off. So I'm not gonna push that onto that barb fitting right now. Um, 
if, if you're working in the cold, if the temperatures are fairly cold, sometimes the poly pipe isn't, isn't as flexible. It's not malleable. And so it's harder to push these on. So if, you know, if you're doing this in the colder parts of the year, sometimes you'll leave your, you'll leave your tubing you know, inside for a minute and then you go get it and you do this. Or if you're really good and really careful, I've known contractors to have just a little teeny torch and they just go over it really, really fast just to warm the, the poly just enough to make it flexible enough to push on easy. But that's dangerous because you can melt it. Great. So, you know, there are fittings, to threaded fittings that allow you to connect to the barb fittings. And I'll show you some more of this in just a second because you would use these when you're converting, going from a main line or going from a valve assembly into the, into the tubing. There's simple little threaded fittings that go straight to barbs. These type of barbs fittings um, or larger three quarter inch pipe looks something like this. This one happens to be threaded. So this would thread on barb fittings over the top. Now, if you're using a three quarter poly with a barb like this, these will push on, but given certain amounts of pressure, that, would, that will work itself off later. So you should use a, a metal hose clamp. Once that's pushed on all the way, use a metal hose clamp and actually tighten that down on this type of a barb. And these down little barbs, hose clamps are not necessary. It, the barb is different, the pipe is a little different, and uh, it, it stays even with pressure, but these will work themselves off. So, Let's talk just for a minute about, <clears throat> so I've, I've showed you the inline emitters, the inline tubing. Now there's other, the other point source type emitters look like the, they can be varied. This one happens to be called a flag emitter. It looks like it has a little flag on the end. So it's got the barb, the barb end that would punch in or the barb end that will connect, will connect to the, the, the quarter inch tubing. So this one actually has a barb in it and an emitter on the end. Now this is a little different kind of emitter and it has a, an emitter with a bug cap. So emitters come in all shapes or forms. So this one, you know, here's a little emitter. It's got the barb end. Sorry, my fingers get the block in here. So it's got the barb end and this is the end that's gonna come out. Now the quarter inch tubing can connect to this just as I showed you in that other picture. But um, usually you just have this as the end and this goes right at the base. Of, you know, if this is your plant, it just doesn't go right here at the base or somewhere, somewhere in the root zone of that plant. Okay, there's different colors. Um, usually emitters are color coded, you know, so each color has a different gallon output to help you not get confused. So in Rainbird, for example, this is a Rainbird one gallon per hour emitter and they're black. A Rainbird two gallon per hour emitter is red. So you'll know if you're using two gallon per hour emitters, you'll know you, they're all red. Um, the different brands have different colors. Um, there's a brand of the flag emitters, their two gallon, two gallon per hour is blue. And they, the little flag on the end is blue. Now the interesting thing about these emitters, the, well, let me jump back. These ones are sealed. If anything ever plugs up in that, you can't do anything about that. But on these little flag emitters, if something kind of gets plugged up, it's not doesn't seem to be putting out any water, you can undo it. The little flag piece kind of comes out and it'll flush water through there and then you can put it back together. And sometimes it's just a little bit of debris gets flushed through and then it works again. So I've, I've actually, you know, there's pros and cons. I like both and I've used both personally. Here in the garden, we use mostly this type of an emitter. Um, we have used these in the past as well, but depending on the pressure, too much pressure, these just pop off. These hold a little better, um, but I like these. I've used some of these at home and I, I flush them out occasionally. And if there's a little bit of debris in there, it works quite well. So, all right. So now we've, we've covered, um, we've covered some emitters. Uh, here we go. Back to our slides for a second. Um, we've covered the poly tubing, we've covered emitters, and how those work. So here's a couple slides that would be part, sparsely planted. Now in this type of situation, depending, if, if they were going to add a lot more plant material in here, then the inline drip tubing might be the way to go. Otherwise, a point source drip would work really well of just putting emitters to each of these plants. Having the poly kind of snake through, burying it, hiding it under the mulch, 
And all of this could be done without overspraying the walkways, without overspraying into the, into the driveway, the curbs, um, you know, spraying onto the houses, the buildings. So these are the great types of applications where drip irrigation can work. Now, I'm gonna transition over to how do you convert um, spray to drip? Say you're, you're changing some things up or you've got spray heads in your, in your flower beds right now and it's, and it's just not working out, blockage or whatever reasons. We would encourage you to use drip. That's one of the principles we'd like to focus on when we teach local scapes and different things is drip irrigation can work effectively if it's, if, if it's understood and set up correctly with filtration, with pressure regulation, and just knowing how to set this up, you'll be very successful and you'll be happy with the results. So there's lots of products on the market that can help you switch over without digging everything up and redoing entire you know, pipe and everything else in the ground. So I'm gonna show you a few of these through slides and then I'm gonna show you some of these that I have here sitting in front of me. Okay, on the first slide here, this is, a spray head, typical spray head in the ground. There are kits, they're little retrofit kits where you can take the main guts out of the spray head. And actually I can probably just show you, well, it'll be bigger if I do it the other way. You can take the guts out of the spray head, you can put new components in, and now it has a little threaded component just like you see on the slide here, where you can convert and put, now start with poly, a poly pipe right off the top of that little connection. And then you can snake that poly around and, add drip. Now the, the challenge with that is if you're doing that on a spray head, there's multiple spray heads in a zone. You need to do the entire zone, cap off heads or do the conversion on all the heads because you cannot operate spray and drip on the same time schedule. The, the volume of waters are so different that you'll end up flooding something before the drip irrigation gets enough water. So if you're converting a zone, you have to convert all of the heads in the zone. You can't just do one and expect them to run and, and be effective. So if you're doing a park strip, for example, and let's say you have eight sprinkler heads out there, all you really need to do is have the conversion kit for one head, and then you can run poly down the length of your park strip, and then just cap all the other heads. Dig them up, put a little cap on the, on the risers or however there is. You can cap all those off so that they, they're still in the ground, there's the pipe's still there, but and they're not spraying and then one one physical connection up run a new poly line across the top hide it in the mulch or whatever you're changing there and that zone's done same with the park strip same with the flower bed um, so that's one way um, another another way are there's different parts that have little output on them. and i'll end this slide here in just a second and show you these yeah this is this is a good place to stop so they've got little little emitter outlets where you can connect up to six or up to eight different tubings off of one. And again, those can go right on top of an existing spray head. Um, so let's, let's do this. Let's show you. So, so here, here's an example of a typical spray head, right? It's, it's got a nozzle on it. Yeah, your typical spray head nozzles. I, if I can get that one up, it just pops up. You know, so here's your spray and it pops up and it has a fixed pattern of spray. So on this, this type of head, it, it's below ground. It sits at the ground level here. So you would typically, you just basically unscrew this top and it has a spring and everything. And that part can come out and you've got the body of the spray head here. So the kit, little retrofit kit, well, it comes with, it, it basically comes with this part here. This is what it comes with as a filter and a little pressure regulator and then the little outputs like I talked about. So that whole thing just slides right inside the body of that other spray head, screw it all in, screw it back together. Now that one's done. Now you can simply start plugging in drip tubing, quarter inch drip tubing to each of these outputs on top and now running those directing to an emitter directed to a plant. Now, excuse me, if you need more than six, this one only has six. So you're thinking, well, I might need more than six. They do have little T connectors in here that you can come off of here. You can put in a T here and branch it out. So you could then have 12 emitters and 12 is not too much for the, the volume you'd need to get through here. I wouldn't recommend T's and T's and T's, you know, putting dozens and dozens of emitters, but you could easily get away with 12 emitters 
off of this type of thing. Now, so if you need more than 12, because you're changing the whole zone, then you'd need a couple kits. Do this and then eight feet to 10 feet or 15 feet over, you should have another head. You convert that one as well and, and so on until you can get as many emitters as you need for the, for the area being irrigated. So if you're converting a whole zone, usually it's, it's completely possible to get all the emitters off of just head conversions like this. Okay, that's one way, one method of doing that. Another one, very similar, is this is a little device. So instead of, instead of, here's your spray body, you know, let me put this one back together. Here's your spray head. You'd have to unscrew the entire spray head from the little nozzle, you know, if it's a riser, so you've got a riser or something. You, you're unscrewing that entire head off of that riser, and then this one screws on in its place. Now the emitters of this this guy, the, emitters, the outputs are here on the bottom. So the, the same principles apply to this. What they've done though is they've, this has a little filter on the inside, just a tiny little screen. And then inside the stem here is a pressure regulator, brings it down. And then you have the, the ports on the inside. Now right now these have little plugs in them. So whichever ones you're not using, you leave the plug in. If you're using one, you take the plug out and then you connect a drip tube, a quarter inch tube to that, run it to your emitter and, uh, and you've got a drip conversion. So these are, this is called a zero bird. This is a rainbird product. You know, that, that works pretty easily. Others, you know, here's a similar kind type of concept, but it's simply just a little riser and then your drip ports coming out on top. So, and there's little screw adjustments to help regulate uh, volume or pressure or something. But, you know, all these components, you can buy these, any, you can buy these pretty much anywhere, Home Depot, Lowe's. Um, sprinkler supply stores. So that's one. Just the top of one. You know, these two are basically the exact same thing. You know, to some very creative kids out there, these are spaceships. You know, these are toys. Um, so if you have little boys, have them help you with your irrigation. And not only will they have fun, but you'll get your drip irrigation done because they're assembling spaceships together, you know. So having a good time with it. So anyway, you can convert spray to drip very easily. And as I mentioned, if you're coming off of us, if you're coming off of that spray head, now this is just a, let me just get this back in the image here. This is just a threaded connect right here. So you can thread that drip port to it, or you can thread, now this doesn't happen to be an elbow, but you could thread on just a fitting with an elbow now and then connect half inch half inch tubing or a three quarter inch tube to this to this coming right out of the spray head that's that's the joy of this kind of conversion is it it does the filtration for you it does the pressure regulation for you at the head and allows you to get a drip zone or a drip area in without digging everything up and redoing main lines and then ideally that's already wired back to your timer and so then you just because you switch the whole zone now you can change the timer to run that zone longer and to get the adequate water through drip irrigation instead of the spray irrigation. So I hope, I hope that makes sense. And I know there's some questions and we'll get to all of, we'll get to all of your questions here uh, before we get too far, before we get too far along. Uh, well, or we'll get to it at the end and then we'll go backwards. Because some of this stuff may require some repetition. I know that the more you hear, the more you see, the better off you'll be, the more successful you'll be with drip irrigation. So I've got a few more slides and then we're gonna we'll jump back and sorry, this is kind of a little back and forth, but it's, I think this is one, I felt like this is a good way to show you. Now there's one more type of pipe with fittings and I kind of just left these grouped at the end because this, this has a little bit of a unique application. So drip tape, trickle tape, or what's called T-tape has a few different names, several different manufacturers. Um, it is a product developed for very low pressure, very equal distribution if you're, if you're able to put them in a line in rows. So for vegetable crops, this is actually used in agriculture locally. They use this in fields in Utah to grow crops. It's used everywhere. Um, I've used this kind of product in a vegetable garden and in raised beds. And so there's different milliliter size of the tubing. And I've got I've got some tubing here. 
and I'll, I mean, I can show you, I should be on your screen very small and I'll, as soon as I get back out of here. Now notice on here, you can kind of see about where my finger is a little incision. You know, in this particular one, we've got, we've got different incisions every four inches. So the spacing of these is four, six, eight, 12, 12 inch spacing of how water comes out. It's a lot like the inline emitters, only there's no emitters in here. It's just been developed. There's a small channels in there that the water flows through. Once it's full, it's, a, it's an actual pipe. It fills up with water and makes it round. Um, but there's a small channels in there that regulates the, the pressure, regulates the flow. And this is very, very low pressure because it's so thin. If it's not, if you, if you have too much pressure, and we know this firsthand experience here in our garden, it'll actually just pop the pipe. And that's what it sounds like. It sounds like a little balloon popping or something where it just <laughs> pop, you know, and now you've got a big hole. It's your pressure is too high. So this, this stuff needs to be brought down depending on how much you have. Now, if you had a really big area, you can flow a lot more water through it because it's, you know, it, that water is moving through more quickly. But very small areas, very, you know, kind of average, average residential raised beds, you're gonna to wanna to bring this down to probably 10 PSI, eight to 10 to 12. I wouldn't go any higher than 12 PSI with uh, drip tape for vegetables in your own yard. Agriculture will go a little higher because they've just got really long runs, really long rows and lots of them. Um, but notice the little fittings. Now there's different ways to do this. Um, if you wanna be ultra, ultra economical and uh, in my case, I'm a cheapskate, so you know, you would, you can do the, the ends, you just kind of take it and you'd basically fold it over, you fold it over a couple times and then fold it a little bit more and then you take one little teeny piece of this and you slide it over the end. Now by folding that over and sliding this in, it's, it's actually kind of sealing up the end. So now it looks like that. That, that because it's low pressure, that'll actually keep it all together and you'll have a little bit of water drip out of there, but not very much. Or there are actual little fittings, there are little screw fittings for both ends. This one actually has a barb for punching into the lateral main line. You still have a polylateral line that this connects to, as you'll see on the picture there. And then this little, just this little fitting slides on. And let me just do this out here. So you just get that to where you can just slide that over the top. And then this just kind of screws over the top of it and it holds it all in place really well. Now that's punched in your main line and then that runs down the row. So this is super easy to work with. <clears throat> it's cheap, it's, eco it's actually economical to buy. Um, if it's left in the sun, it may only last one to two years because it can get brittle. And as it bends, if you're moving it around trying to get it off and till your garden or whatever, it'll bend, make little cracks, make little holes, and then you can run a new line because it's only pennies per foot for this kind of stuff. It's, it's kind of meant to, it's meant to not last forever because it's fairly economical, but it pressure regulates very well. And so you're getting equal distribution of water from the first of the row all the way to the end. That's why I've used it in a vegetable garden. You don't have to worry about sprinklers going everywhere. You don't have to worry about water running down furrows and, and just, you know, trying to keep track of everything. You run this just run these down the length of the rows. I've grown corn with this. If, even on plants where you're spacing them apart a bit, you got tomatoes that are spaced a few feet apart or there's pumpkins or gourds or whatever, this still works. You have a little bit of water between the plants that's still happening, but you're not, you're not wasting much um, compared to what you would be doing spray irrigation or something else. So I, this, this is a great application for raised beds or for uh, vegetables in just regular in-ground applications. Here's, a, here's an example of those, you know, drip tape. Now they can be spaced as far apart as you need them for the rows you're doing. In a raised bed, if you're really cramming plant material in there, you'd space these maybe 12 inches apart. <clears throat> and then as the water comes out and soaks in, it's, all, it's watering everything quite thoroughly through that application. All right, so, um, <clears throat> Here's another drip tape continued, you know, using hose end connection. You can connect these with a hose, with a valve on a hose. Um, you can have little valves on each one so that if something's done growing, you can shut off just one, uh, one line as opposed to the whole line, the whole, the whole setup. They sell all of these things, just little teeny drip valves, little teeny things. Um, the, the quality, the eight milliliter versus 15 milliliters, just the thickness of the plastic 
you know, if it's a little more thick, a little more rigid, <clears throat> it can it can last a little bit longer. It can be buried, it, left under mulch. Keeping it out of the sun is the best. It'll last a few years. Mine typically lasts two to three years, and then I end up getting some holes in them, and then I just replace them. But I've used those in my I have vegetable garden. Maybe my rows are probably 20 feet, 25, I'd say 25 or so feet long, and I've got about 20 of them. Works fantastic, works really great. Pressure compensating, equal, equal uniformity the whole length. Okay, so here's some resources and I'm gonna switch out of here and then I've got a few more things to show you. <clears throat> and then we'll just deal with some questions, excuse me. We'll deal with some questions, um, specific things that you, know, you have that may be situations in your own yard and so forth. Um, but, and this is being recorded. So if you miss some of these resources, these are all just drip resources that that have good information. Utah State University with the Center of Water Efficient Landscaping is the last one. They've got some good stuff on drip irrigation there as well. Um, so I'll stop, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll stop sharing that. And then um, let's, let's just, I want to just do just a couple more things. So I had, <clears throat> I have just this really simple, simple little thing. So this is an, an inline emitter setup. And I have to come back here a little bit so you can see this. This is really, really simplified. Water source coming in here, shown in a, in a drip or in a grid-like pattern. Now, these happen to be spaced about eight inches apart. You can space these whatever you want if you're gonna use this, run it snaking around your yard. So this was just a very small illustration of how you might do that. I've already showed you this, but you know, you can punch in in that poly line if you're doing point source emitters, you can punch these in as close, you know, these are a couple inches apart and you may have some plants that are fairly close together and you can just punch in emitters anywhere along that pipe that you need. Now, I didn't talk about, if you make a mistake and you punch in a barb that you don't need, they sell little goof plugs and they, they're actually called goof plugs. So you can pop that one out, grab it with pliers, you pull it out, and you punch in a, a goof plug in its place and that plugs up that hole where that barb used to be. So if you move a plant, the plant dies, you no longer need this one. Um, it, it just easy to fix. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna talk about scheduling, how long you would run these types of zones. And I think that may be a question that just popped up is how long should you expect in line? Well, no, I'll get to that question. Actually, I'll do, get to it now. How long should you expect inline drip tubing to last? It should last a long time. If it's kept out of the sun, the poly pipe is very rigid, very, very, you know, very thick and doable. And it'll, if it's kept out of the sun, it'll last years and years and years. If it's in the sun, slowly it will get brittle and it can crack. And then you can have, have to replace some of that. Both the quarter inch tubing and the, uh, the poly lines, it's best to keep them out of the sun. Even the inline drip tubing, all of them, they're all poly. The sun is your, your worst enemy for this kind of stuff. So if you have any of these out in the sun, the, the life expectancy will be shorter. They'll still last for several years. You, know, you might get 10 years out of them before, before you start cracking. I know in our garden here, these quarter inch tubings, after about three or four years just in the sun, they'll start to get little teeny cracks and just little teeny sprays poking out and then you end up having to replace back to the barb, um, back to your emitter, because the, you know, at that point they start to just get brittle. It's a thinner, thinner tube, um, just starts to get brittle. So before I address any more questions, I wanna talk about scheduling. So typically on an emitter that's putting out one gallon per hour, you think about that, one gallon of water going on a plant depending on your soil, that could soak in eight inches or it could soak in six, but kind of spread a little bit. So typically on a one gallon per hour emitter, you're gonna run that zone for one hour. You're putting one, now it depends on plant material too, but a typical perennial, you'll say you have a perennial, mixed perennial bed, one gallon per hour per plant is going to be enough for one irrigation event. That's gonna soak the root zone good. Now, depending on the soil, how frequently you need to do that is gonna be the variable thing. For sandy, looser soils, you may need to do that twice a week or three times a week. It depends. Now, if you have really, really loose soil, I would recommend shortening that cycle a little bit and going more frequently. 
full hour, maybe you get too much, it's below the root zone. Um, so you shorten it up to 45 minutes and then you're watering three times a week. In our demonstration garden here, with some of the drip zones, twice a week midsummer is kind of the, the standard. You know, now there's newer areas where we've planted new plant material. There's some areas maybe the plants don't tolerate the heat quite as well. And those may get three days a week at the one, one gallon per hour rate. Now we have zones, if you bump that up to a two gallon per hour emitter, then think of you're doubling the volume, you can cut the time in half. So you'd water a half an hour to get the same gallon of water on that plant. And that's kind of what you need to gauge is you look at the soils, you look at your plant material. Now trees, some of how you control this for different plant material is you can add multiple emitters to a plant that needs a little more water. If you have a large tree or a large shrub, one gallon of water isn't gonna do the same for it as one gallon on a small perennial. So you would add three or four emitters to that tree or increase the volume. You have one gallon per hour emitters everywhere, but two or three, two gallon or five gallon an hour emitter on the tree. So the tree now gets plenty of water in that same amount of time. I hope that makes sense is you're, you're gauging volume and time. Now, typical spray head application, you may be running your zones anywhere from 10 minutes to an hour, depending on what they are. The gear driven rotor heads can sometimes take an hour um, to, to apply water over the whole lawn and get enough for half an inch. Um, but sometimes you're, you're only running for 15 minutes. 15 minutes will not be enough on drip irrigation. You've got to, hopefully your timer allows you to be able to create programs. You have program A that's for spray heads and program B that's for drip or and program C that's for your vegetable garden or something like that, where you're able to dictate different frequencies and different times for the different irrigation zones. So your spray heads on your lawn all run at a certain thing, a frequency, and then your drip can run for an hour or 70 minutes um, to, to meet the needs of everything in that drip zone. So really, really important though that you, that you schedule that properly because if you, if you just leave it running with what the grass was doing, you're going to be disappointed. Something's not gonna get enough water. So please factor all that into your scheduling and, and make sure you're scheduling that appropriately. Now, don't always just equate running an hour to, oh, that's a lot of water, that's gonna be a lot. Remember, you've cut, the, instead of going gallons per minute in spray irrigation, you're doing gallons per hour for drip and not nearly the, the, the gallons going through the pipe as spray irrigation zones. Instead of three gallons a minute going through each spray head, now you've got three gallons per hour and three different emitters. You know, so the, the, the volume is just crazy different. Um, so drip irrigation can save a huge amount of water as well if it's set up and you're watering at proper frequency and proper time and your plants are getting plenty of water to meet their needs. So, all right, there's a question here that's exper um, experimented drip lines in my garden, did a combination grid of soaker and drip hoses in my boxes. I don't think the soaker areas are efficient. How much water does a soaker give out versus drip? Okay, soaker hoses, I didn't talk about them because they're not truly drip irrigation. I mean, they, they are, I guess in theory. Soaker hoses do not equalize the distribution of water. There's nothing in them that regulates how much water goes anywhere. It's just a little tube with a bunch of opening porous holes. And so at the front where you connect that to the hose where there's the most pressure, you're gonna get way more water than at the end. And there's nothing equalizing that throughout. So drip irrigation is gonna allow you to regulate flow equally depending again on the type of, type of drip product you use, you can equalize the volume on every output rather than just having it here and there. Now some people use soaker hoses and they, they don't mind because they're wrapping them around and looping them around and, you know, and it, it soaks everything up, but it's usually not a very efficient way to, to do drip irrigation. Um, so soaker hoses can also put out quite a bit more water. They're, again, it, there's no regulation, so it's hard to say because it's just a porous tube, allows water out everywhere. So I don't even know what the flow rates for soaker hoses are. I haven't done that much, you know, investigating into that. But drip irrigation, you can control the volume, you can control the flow perfectly by the emitter output or by, you know, the inline emitter output. You're, you're dictating how fast water is gonna come out of that tube. And then now you know the total length of time you need 
to get the total volume. If you need to run it for an hour to get two gallons per hour, you do that. You know, half an hour to get two gallons per hour, you do that. Um, you have a lot more control with the with actual drip irrigation products. So I, I hope that answered that question. So this was a little bit shorter than some of the classes. I know it's fairly focused. It's fair, you know, fairly narrow in its scope of you know, products and types. Um, I tried. My intent was not to go into every every single scenario. Some of you may have very specific scenarios. If that's the case, um, please email me. You you should see my email on your screen. It's drice at weaverbasin.com. Email me if you have some pictures or a phone number. I can call you back. Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions about drip irrigation um, and, and help you with specific scenarios. If you have a picture of something you know, you're struggling with, um, I, we've, we've used drip irrigation here in the garden since the garden was built. I was here right after the garden was built. The garden's about 12 years old. Um, we've used it here in different methods. I've used it at home. I like it. I have secondary water. And it works with secondary water. The key is proper filtration. I can't stress that enough. And then depending on where you are in the secondary system, everybody's got some different issues. Some of you have to clean your filters a lot. And it just happens to be the hydraulics of where you are in the system. Some of you may only have to clean your filter once a month. Uh, but yeah, keep on it. Regardless of where you are and how much debris ends up in your filter, keep on that filter, clean it. If it doesn't get cleaned, the filter can get so gunked up, it limits the flow and you'll basically not get any water through your pipes. Um, I've seen that happen. So just check your filters, clean them regularly and, uh, and you can be successful. If, yeah, again, if you have other questions, I'm happy to answer those. We'll stay on here for just a minute. We appreciate all of you joining us. Um, really appreciate that. Again, check our class schedule. We've got some other classes. If you're interested in cut flowers, that's going to be our next week class, just you know, a little more on the ornamental side and just the fun, uh, using it for arrangements or something. We've got a local scape introduction class coming up. We've got an evergreen class coming up, some on artificial grasses, uh, the different, different pros and cons of using artificial grass, if that's an option for you, and, uh, and, and a couple others. Some fall gardening with bulbs. So between now and the end of September, several more classes, and we look forward to having you join us. Um, one more question popped up with a video. Will this video be posted? Yes, it usually takes us about a day. We got to take the video. It's got to be downloaded. It's got just a, a tiny bit of formatting that needs to be done and then we post it on our website. Uh, if you'll go to weberbasin.com and in the classes section, you will see uh, the, the recorded versions of the classes. They, they basically get posted, posted to a YouTube channel and then you can watch those at any time again. And we appreciate you watching them. Um, share, the, share the knowledge that these classes are available. We're here to try to educate and help people. And uh, we're just grateful that you've joined us. If also with, with the COVID things going on, there's so many things shut down, the garden is open. So if you're interested in coming and checking out the garden, looking at some plants, um, you can talk to Janice or, or Robin out in the garden. They're, they're out there working, doing some things. It, please come by, visit the garden, it's open. You know, pretty much eight to eight every day. And you're sure welcome to come and just walk around, get, get some ideas for your yard. That's what it's here for. Um, the garden's located at 2837 East Highway 193 in Layton. Um, so look forward to seeing you here at the garden and joining us for other classes. So we'll, I'll leave it up in just another, just another minute if you have any other questions or comments and otherwise, appreciate you joining us. Have a great afternoon and I look forward to seeing you again next week. So the address again is 2837 East Highway 193 in Layton. Um, it's just, just off, of, off of Highway 189, excuse me, not 189, off of Highway 89 as you're heading east, not all backwards, heading west towards Hill Air Force Base. Um, so if you've been by Hill Air Force Base, we're just on the, the end of that road just before it joins Highway 89. So again, thanks for that question and everyone have a good afternoon.